Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Acronix with Chris Pelosi, who's going to talk today about how to verify an embedded FPGA. Chris, how do you verify a standard FPGA, a discrete FPGA? Uh, okay, so uh, first thing we want to define is what does it mean to uh, verify something in the first place? And if we're talking about a design that's mapped into an FPGA, uh, generally what you would mean is confirming that the functionality of the RTL that somebody wrote for that FPGA functions as expected. Um, so if we had to sort of uh, draw, draw a timeline here of the simulation models, you'll start with some RTL that the user will write. They'll code this up in Verilog and, and maybe run it through a simulator and confirm that it works as expected. Uh, they'll then push it through some kind of sim uh, synthesis engine. So I'll write this as synthesis and you'll get a gate level netlist. Again, this gate level netlist will be specific to an FPGA, so it'll have things like lookup tables and flip-flops for that FPGA. And then the final step, you'll push it through um, some software from the FPGA vendor, and I'll call it uh, sort of PNR netlist. Like that. And again, this will also have lookup tables and flip-flops and things that are inside an FPGA. Uh, but more specific to the to the vendor for that FPGA. So all of these steps along the way, you can run simulation. Sim, sim, sim. And you're basically just confirming that the output vectors match what the expectation is. Uh, when it comes time to actually running these designs on hardware, you simply take the resulting bitstream from this last step, program your FPGA, and run it on the board. And it's really the responsibility of the FPGA vendor to make sure that their, their simulation models match the expectation that you'll have on silicon. So what's the difference when you go from a discrete FPGA to an embedded FPGA? Uh, okay, so first let's talk about uh, verification of IPs in general. So the, the verification that I've just described here um, is for a general purpose standalone FPGA that you might purchase uh, and put on your board. In that sense, the FPGA is really a black box. Uh, the customer of the FPGA simply puts it on connects up the right pins based on what they've placed in their design, and it should just work. And it's the responsibility of the FPGA vendor to make that so. Uh, in the case of an IP, um, it's a little bit more strict. So if you have an ASIC, let's talk about um, having an ASIC here. And I'm an ASIC integrator, and I'm going to integrate an IP, and I want to make sure that A, that IP works as expected, and B, I've hooked it up correctly. Um, it's a little bit different than uh, an FPGA where you are expecting the FPGA to function correctly and you don't really have to do a lot of extra verification for that. In this case, I'm gonna buy an IP. I'm gonna put it here in my ASIC. And the IP, provi the IP provider is going to give me a model for how that IP behaves. So when I run my simulations, I'm gonna run a simulation before tape out of my ASIC from my pins. And some of those paths will go through to the IP. The IP model will uh, describe how, how the behavior of that IP works and then the outputs will come out and I can check that they're correct and, and I'll, I'll get the, the go ahead before we tape out the ASIC. Uh, so that's generally how it would work for any IP. So you're thinking of an embedded FPGA as an IP block within the ASIC, right? Absolutely, yeah. So in, in, you always have to think of an embedded FPGA as having two sides. There's the traditional side where it looks just like an FPGA it has an end user that's writing RTL that maps into that FPGA. But now we have this other dimension where the FPGA also acts like an embedded IP. So similar to how uh, an ASIC integrator might buy a PLL or a DLL and have to integrate that, um, we would have the same constraints for an embedded FPGA. So you've got to characterize this FPGA depending upon the size, on how fast it's going to be running, whatever you're using that for in that particular design, right? Exactly, yeah, and that's where the extra complication comes in. So if we go back to the picture here where uh, we've got the ASIC and a generic uh, IP that's been integrated, um, what happens if this IP is an embedded FPGA? Well, if, if you're familiar with an FPGA, you know it's a, a two-step process. The first step is that you uh, program the FPGA to get all the bits in the right places, and then you start sending vectors in um, and expecting functionality on the output. And that last step is really a function of what your user design has been mapped to, to perform. So if we look here at, at the picture, um, for I'll draw a blow up of what this IP block might look like for an FPGA. Uh, 
there's going to be some fixed pins because again, this is a hard IP that's being delivered. These pins do not change. There's something that the hardware integrator must see and connect to and, and uh, run timing against and, and, and verify against. Uh, inside, there will be some amount of logic um, that's also fixed. So this is logic, for example, to program the FPGA, some kind of state machine for sending bits in and out. So I'll, I'll uh, put that as program here. And then there is the sort of FPGA fabric. That's where all of the user design that is written gets mapped into. So I'll just say user logic over here. So when we're talking about verifying, we have we have actually two aspects that we need to verify. The first is that we can uh, talk from our controller in ASIC to program in and out of the uh, embedded FPGA. For that, the function is no different than any other IP. The pins on here are the programming interface pins. The function is fixed. Um, this, this is usually implemented in standard cell or some fixed logic. Uh, the functionality doesn't change. So in that sense, that is exactly like verifying any other kind of IP. For verifying this other block in here, um, that you might ask, um, you, you might say is different than, is different for every single user design that anybody might map into your FPGA. So how do we know which design to verify and how do we know that everything is hooked up correctly? So one of the things about an, an embedded FPGA is there's no fixed function. This is sort of a uh, piece of clay that you're molding for whatever you're doing within the, the design, and it may vary from one design to the next, even within the same company or within derivative chips. What happens in terms of verifying that? You're now trying to say, what does the thing actually look like for this design and how does it affect this design? Right, so the, the way that we've solved this at Acronix, the way that we've handled verification where the end design function might change per user design, um, is that we actually, we develop a model that looks a lot like this picture that I've drawn here. And the, the first step is uh, essentially to make sure that your programming interface is first working. That's a fixed function, we verify that as normal. Uh, the second step is to verify what all the connections in and out of this block that I've called a, a user block. Uh, in, in the very first, model that you would deliver, that we would deliver as, a, um, as, a, as a model for the ASIC integrator, this block here is actually empty. So it has no functionality. It has all of the hardware pin names. So these are fixed and these are pins that the ASIC integrator would see in their models and they would hook up to it. But if they tried to run vectors from their pins through to the user section here, it wouldn't do anything. It's completely empty. And the reason is because it's sort of uh, modeling an unconfigured FPGA. So the next step for the ASIC integrator is to collect a suite of designs they would like to use for sign-off. Um, this is basically a list of, of designs that they're going to end up pushing through the software and coming up with bit streams and place and routed designs uh, for each of those. A, a, good way, a good strategy for those would be to pick, for example, uh, a user design that uses all of the hardware pins that you wanted to connect to uh, in the ASIC. Once you've got your, your list of designs, you can push that through the flow. And what we would need at that point is a way to stitch that model, really this netlist here, in with the picture down here, which is the, the ASIC integrator's view of things. So how do we stitch those things together? The way that we've solved this is um, by basically having our software output a wrapper that maps between the two domains. And so uh, from the pin perspective, if you think about it, the ASIC integrator always sees these pins along the edge uh, of our IP. So those pins have fixed names, they hook up to them in their Verilog, and, and that's that. Um, uh, under the hood, the netlist that the users created for each of their designs will have inputs and outputs named according to whatever their logic did. So they may call it A, B, C, and out, for example. Um, whereas the pins on, uh, on an embedded FPGA will be chosen by the, the uh, FPGA vendor. Are the verification of the EFPGA in a classic ASIC much different? Do you need different skill sets or can the, the ASIC uh, verification team still do the same thing? From the perspective of the ASIC integrator, everything in the, in the process of verif verifying an embedded FPGA mm -hmm. looks exactly the same as verifying any other IP that you might have. It's just that they would need some help from uh, some, some, some group at their company, for example, that has experience writing these designs. So they can get the infrastructure and the harness and the Verilog all hooked up for their test benches um, to simulate just like they would do any other IP. 
But really what comes into play is what goes into this box to say, um, yes, this is hooked up correctly, this is good. Um, we've checked that all the functionality is, is working. So usually what we'll recommend is that they first pipe clean with some simple tests that uh, interface only with the programming blocks, make sure they can program the bits in and out, um, and then get that suite of designs from their FPGA team, uh, whoever will be end up writing those, uh, those user designs, and then one by one swap those in and, uh, and, and start verifying the functionality for that block. Once this is out in the field, once it's already post-production, are there is it the same kind of flexibility that you'd get out of a, a standard FPGA for we can fix this out in the field uh, as opposed to having to work on the software and workarounds that way? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, once this has been integrated and is deployed in your ASIC, the embedded FPGA will have all the benefits that a, a traditional FPGA would have. So for example, if um, you found that there's some, here we'll go back to the ASIC picture, if there's some logic over here that talks to the uh, embedded FPGA, and there's maybe some, some features that are broken that were previously implemented in this section, um, you can A, bring, bring the, some of those signals over to the embedded FPGA for debug, or even push some of the functionality into the user space um, and have it run in the FPGA instead. Typically when you're working with IP, one of the things that you do is you have a very fixed model. You know exactly which pins they are, you know um, how the thing's going to be used. There's only a certain number of ways that it can be used. With an EFPGA, you're opening up a, a lot of different possibilities too with that. How do you deal with that? Right, that's a good point. So um, if we look back to the, to the picture I've drawn here, uh, as I mentioned, the, the embedded FPGA has a fixed set of pins, and those, those pins have specific names so that the ASIC integrator can hook up to them. Um, what, what the functionality behind those pins is depends entirely on what the, um, the owner of the, the, end, the user RTL has implemented in the FPGA. So for example, uh, let's say that we've created a netlist here that has pins uh, in zero, in one as inputs and out. So I'll, I'll draw a little a bubble here in zero, in one, and out. And this has some functionality that the FPGA developer has verified. When you, when you apply the right stimulus on in zero and in one, you get what you want on out. So now how do we test that in the, in the ASIC environment from the pins of the embedded FPGA? So basically, as I mentioned earlier, the original drop that we give for the, for the model of the embedded FPGA has nothing in this, uh, let's take this has nothing in this area here. It's just an empty model. If you were to try to run vectors with that, it wouldn't have any functionality. And the way we solve this at Acronix is when we dump out this netlist, we also dump out a level of hierarchy that exactly matches the hardware hierarchy in, in, uh, in our embedded FPGA with the hardware pin names here and here, and some connections between those and the uh, user's RTL. And those connections are based on how the, the owner of the uh, FPGA RTL has placed their pins. So just like in a standalone FPGA where you might take your pins and place them on specific uh, IOs or balls and connect those on your board, in an embedded FPGA you also place pins um, so that they map to specific hardware pins on the embedded FPGA IP. So then when the ASIC integrator integrates, they hook up to those exact same pins and the functionality will go through and come out the other side. And so basically what you've done is create a wrapper for this, right? Exactly. Chris Pelosi, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome, Ed.